All right, it looks like we have a pretty good group going. And uh, and so I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. So uh, thank you all so much again for having us, for joining, signing up for this webinar with ISSA. Um, as Martha mentioned, my name is Ryan Rotundo. I'm the manager of employment programs at the National Down Syndrome Society. Um, I get to wear a couple different hats in how I serve in the disability community, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, later on in our presentation, uh, but I will go ahead and get started by sharing a little bit more about the National Down Syndrome Society and what it is that that we do and really what um, Down Syndrome is. We never really want to start one of these uh, presentations with any assumptions around a person or a group's uh, familiarity with Down Syndrome or with our organization. So um, forgive us if we are starting at a, a pretty foundational level here, if, if you're someone that is very familiar with the subject but certainly wanna make sure that we all have kind of that foundation uh, and that baseline of information moving forward. So, um, so the National Down Syndrome Society is a nonprofit, a national nonprofit organization that began in the late 1970s. Uh, we were founded in 1979. And it's important to note that the National Down Syndrome Society began uh, because a parent, a mother saw a need in the community uh, for more information, resources, and um, advocacy work to be done to support uh, her daughter who has Down syndrome uh, and others like her and their family in, in the community. So the National Down Syndrome Society, uh, like I said, started in 1979 and was up until recently headquartered in New York City. We just moved our offices over the summer to Washington, D.C. to really be closer to Capitol Hill and a lot of the action that takes place in the capital of our nation, as well as um, just to be closer to some of our other affiliates and partners in the community. The mission of the National Down Syndrome Society is uh, the leading human rights organization for all individuals with Down syndrome. And uh, we envision a world in which all people with Down syndrome have the opportunity to enhance their quality of life, <clears throat> realize their life aspirations, and become valued members of welcoming communities. And I will say this with a bit of a caveat, as we are currently in the middle of our strategic planning process, um, and so Kayla, Charlotte, as well as many of the other members of our team and I have participated in some revisioning. So we would highly encourage all of you to stay tuned, uh, visit our website in the months ahead and uh, to stay uh, abreast of what it is that we're working on for the future of our organization. Some very exciting things happening at NDSS. So let's take a step back and again, wanna lay a little bit of a foundation around what is Down syndrome? So according to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is um, a federal law that uh, protects and serves individuals with disabilities in the public school setting around the country, there are 13 disability categories. Now, some of those categories might vary slightly in definition and structure um, based on, you know, from one state to another. But one of those categories is the category of intellectual or developmental disability. So we think of developmental disability as kind of the broader umbrella under which intellectual disability would fall. Oftentimes uh, in the line of work that we are in, in this sort of the disability service system, you'll hear people refer to this simply as IDD. I know that we all have a lot of acronyms in our respective organizations and industries. So um, the disability service field is, is no different, but we'll try to make sure that we spell out these acronyms as we go through and explain some of these pieces. So intellectual disability is defined as a condition characterized by a significant limitation or significant limitations in both intellectual functioning and adaptive behavior that, and here's a key, it originates before the age of 22. So this is not something that is acquired. In many cases, an intellectual disability is something that an individual will be born with. Um, and a couple examples would be uh, Down syndrome, autism, fragile X, and, and several others. I also wanna note a couple of um, areas that are identified as characteristics or sort of defining pieces of intellectual disability. Now, I do also want to say with this disclaimer that um, these are based on sort of textbook definitions. We hope that through the course of this presentation and some of the stories and, uh, and testimony that you'll hear from Charlotte, from Kayla, myself, um, you will understand and begin to see that these textbook definitions do not put um, uh, limitations on individuals with Down syndrome and other disabilities that in many cases, I would say in most cases, individuals with disabilities are far more capable than these um, sometimes antiquated definitions would imply. 
So again, some of these uh, characteristics, according to uh, the medical journals and definitions would be around intellectual functioning um, or intelligence, being able to reason and problem solve, looking at IQ scores, oftentimes kind of again, referencing back to the public school setting, students that are identified as uh, needing additional support, having a disability, there are oftentimes associated with those um, identifications, educational and psychological evaluations that would determine an individual's um, IQ score, and therefore also the programming that would be in place for them to be able to access the general curriculum in the education setting. Um, and if we could do a show of hands, I would love to ask this question, but really want you to um, in, instead think about your personal connections to disability. Think about as you were maybe growing up, a kid in school, thinking um, back to circles of friends that you had or just in interactions and encounters you may have had with individuals with disabilities in the school setting. Um, some of you may come from a generation where inclusive practices within the classroom setting or in public schools was not a very common occurrence. Some of you may come from a generation where uh, full inclusion or maybe an area of the country where full inclusion was very much a part of the school system and therefore individuals with disabilities were were integrated or included in your classes. Um, so there's a wider range of, of um, experiences. And we really want folks to kind of think through how those experiences in your personal lives have maybe impacted your philosophies, your perspectives as you've taken on uh, new roles in employment and in your community. And we wanna encourage individuals um, and, and folks that are listening to this to think through um, how we might be able to shift some of our paradigms from what was to what could be in terms of including individuals with disabilities in the workplace. I wanna go um, over quickly too, to talk a little bit about some of the adaptive behavior okay. pieces that are identified as or characterized um, within the intellectual um, disability space. So things like social skills, practical skills and conceptual skills, you look at social responsibility, uh, self-esteem, uh, gullibility, being able to, um, or be the naivete, social problem solving, sort of thinking through interactions with others, practical skills being things like healthcare, safety, use of money, schedules and routines, and then conceptual skills like language and literacy and self-direction, being able to make decisions and advocate for one's own goals and uh, vision for their future. So these are all areas that, again, by definition, are considered deficits within the IDD space. Um, we hope that through the course of this presentation, you will see that um, in many ways, individuals with intellectual developmental disabilities and particularly Down syndrome have, have really shattered um, some of these preconceived notions as to what can be accomplished. So a couple of quick facts around Down syndrome. Um, individuals with Down syndrome uh, have three copies of the 21st chromosome. So three copies of the 21st chromosome. I give you the visual there because the numbers 3, 2, 1 are very significant within the Down syndrome community. Um, I've, I've got my uh, fancy water bottle here uh, that that is a got a logo from one of our um, programs around health and wellness, the 3, 2, 1 fitness program that we've launched with National Down Syndrome Society to help individuals with Down syndrome lead uh, happy and healthy lives. 321 is also uh, a date that we celebrate. So March 21st is now known as World Down Syndrome Day and Kayla's got her 321 there uh, on display. Uh, it's a very important number and again, a great cause for celebration in the Down syndrome community. So this um, third copy of the 21st chromosome is unique. Folks who are considered you know, typically developing would only have two copies of that chromosome. It's also important to note that there's really no definitive scientific research around um, what causes this environmental um, or this change in the chromosomes, right? Environmental <clears throat> factors, uh, parental activity, things like that are really not indicators um, or, or um, uh, predictors of this third copy of the 21st chromosome. And also Down syndrome is named after English physician John Langdon Down, who first characterized this genetic uh, abnormality. Uh, a few common physical traits of Down syndrome are low muscle tone, small stature, um, an upward slant to the eyes, and a single deep crease across the center of the palm known as a single palmer's crease. Um, each person with Down syndrome is unique. Uh, an individual may possess these characteristics to some degree or some not at all. And approximately at this day and age, uh, one in 772 individuals, approximately 5,100 
total babies are born with Down syndrome in the United States each year. And it's important to note as we're uh, starting to, again, get more into our uh, ideas around uh, demystifying ability level and understanding that people with Down syndrome are capable of so much that individuals with Down syndrome can be included in their general education classrooms uh, with their peers. They can work in offices. They can own their own businesses. In fact, we have hundreds of, of uh, businesses that are either owned or operated by individuals with Down syndrome featured on the National Down Syndrome Society's employment program page. We love to shout from the rooftops of these success stories and really highlight the great work that individuals um, and their families and their supports are doing in the community to really uh, share this mission of, of overcoming obstacles, but also just to, to really show what individuals with Down syndrome are capable of. We also have uh, a member of our team at NDSS who we, we kind of joke is, uh, is really a movie star. I mean, he's a movie star in his own right. He's been in several Hallmark films and, and a couple TV commercials. And so uh, really the sky is the limit. And that's the message that we want folks to hear. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to one of our uh, amazing staff members. Kayla McEwen is a speaker, advocate, and a graduate. She's also a gold medalist in bocce ball with the Special Olympics participating in not only national, but even world games uh, in the past. She was named the National Down Syndrome Society Self-Advocate of the Year in 2016. And she is also, well, I'm not going to steal your thunder, Kayla. I'll let you go. You're Take good. It. Go for it. <laughs> the first registered lobbyist with Down syndrome. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Kayla. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for that warm introduction. And good afternoon. I'd like to thank all of you for inviting me here today to speak to all of you. As you know, my name is Kayla McEwen, and I am the manager of grassroots advocacy in the National Down Syndrome Society. I am also known as the first registered lobbyist with Down syndrome. Now, I'd like to start today by telling a little bit about myself and share the story of how I came to work for the National Down Syndrome Society and become a lobbyist. I am from Syracuse, New York, home of the Orange. When I was 18 months old, my parents enrolled me in an early education program at Main Street School. I progressed through school alongside my classmates, and I graduated at age 18. And as soon as inclusive education became possible, I was always in an inclusive setting. And I won't deny there were some bumps and stumbling blocks along the way. But my parents always thought it was best for me to be included with my classmates and place in settings that challenged me to reach for my highest potential. There were times when they pushed me, but it was always because they knew I could succeed. When I was 13 years old, I got involved with Special Olympics. I still play many sports each season. It was through Special Olympics that I gave my first speech. And wow, I found out I really liked it. Excuse me, loved it. I learned that I had the ability to speak for others who could not speak for themselves. I will continue to speak on behalf of Special Olympics as a Congress member and ambassador for them. I actually traveled to Athens, Greece as a World Game athlete in 2011. And I've been invited to participate this June, this past June, in the USA Games in Orlando, Florida, where I medaled in gold and bronze in competition. Pretty cool, right? I also attended Anadarka Community College, taking some non-credit courses. When I started thinking to myself, well, this doesn't make sense. I'm doing all this work and without earning any credits. But I really did like the classes. So I began taking one course per semester for credit. I can happily say if those 12 barely long years, I finally received my associate's degree this May, cum laude, and I graduated with my peers. I'm extremely excited. Can you tell? But throughout my time in school, working was a top priority of mine and will always will be. But before I started with the National Down Student Society, I had a couple of jobs. I used to work at the Syracuse Post Standard 
the human resource department. I would assist in the archive section and the sister was setting up events. I even had my own byline in the paper, which was newspaper, which I thought was very cool. I also had a job at Paparazzi Salon and Day Spa, where I would help at the front desk, greeting customers as they walked in. And sometimes I was just in cleaning up. But my ultimately, my favorite part was interacting with the customers. As you couldn't tell, I'm very much a people person. And the front desk is where you will find me mostly. I worked there for 14 years. My mental racial always provided me with support while working at the salon. And I really benefited from Rachel providing clear instructions, a checklist, and support when needed. I also worked at the front desk at my local YMCA. Again, it was more an interaction with the customers that I loved the best. But several years ago, I became involved with a national Down Syndrome Society as a volunteer while I was still working at the hair salon. In 2016, I was named the Self-Advocate of the Year. In the meantime, back in Syracuse, I met a John Kierko, who was running for the U.S. House of Representatives. He handed me his business card, so I handed him mine. And he called me and said if he was elected, that he wanted me to come and work for him. Well, guess what? He won! And his election, and I became an intern in his Syracuse office. I took a lead on data entry and management. I also represented him at different events, such as citizenship awards on his behalf. And I became a valued member of his office staff, alongside my non-disabled co-workers, and I made friends within the, his Syracuse office. While I was interning for the congressman, so this is where I was definitely multitasking. I was also working at a local restaurant in Syrac here in Syracuse called Modern Malt, which is an electric buffet diner. I was the hostess, and my job I consisted of seeing patrons and running food to the customers. That was my favorite part of Modern Malt. But as you can see, I came myself very, very busy. In June of 2017, when I was working at the diner, and of course interning with the Congress representative, the representative asked me to go with him to a disability conference in Washington. I didn't realize at the time it was with the National Down Syndrome Society. It was there at the end of the conference, the NDSS, of me, my job of manager of grassroots advocacy. And you know what they say, the rest is history. I started working for NDSS in October 2017, and no, I've never looked back. And my role as a manager of grassroots advocacy, I am solely responsible of educating others on what people with Down syndrome are capable of doing and in lobbying to members of Congress who pass laws that positively impact the Down syndrome community. I have spoken to elementary schools, middle schools, colleges, and my personal favorite, the School of Nursing. I try to motivate them to do the best that they can do. My message to kids is to persevere. When I deliver speaking engagements, such as this one, I speak about education, employment, my accomplishments, my self-advocacy, and now legislation to affect all of us with disabilities. I have a passion for speaking and motivating others to try their best and never give up. I tell people that Down syndrome is not a sick diagnosis. I tell them that we are living proof of much more than what is expected of us and all the things that we are capable of doing. I tell about my friends who own businesses that are thriving, like John Cronin of John's Crazy Socks, or Blake Pyron 
who always makes snow tracks in Stango, Texas. Okay, Borderline, who is a third of people back about in karate? Watch out! I tell about the girl who got a new job at Target. I could go on and on, but if we did that, we'd be here all day. And I think we have a couple more speakers after me, so I won't do that to you. But we are exceeding the expectations every day. Please, don't limit us. Don't squash our dreams. Down syndrome doesn't stop us. And never stops us. There's some old antiquated laws and mindsets that hold us back. I love being a self-advocate, sharing my voice. I love living on my own. Can you tell? Having my driver's license. Being in a committed relationship with my loving boyfriend. Absolutely. But most of all, I love working at NDSS, owning a paycheck, because we are more alike than different. And thank you again for having us to speak with you tonight. And now it is my pleasure and esteemed colleague to pass it over to our very own Charlotte Woodward. Charlotte? Hello, everyone. My name is Charlotte Woodward. I am the Education Program Associate at the National Down Syndrome Society, and I'm so excited and honored to speak to you today. I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I am proud to say that I have Down Syndrome, which is a condition that occurs when an individual has an extra copy of the 21st chromosome in their cells. Down Syndrome is the most common chromosomal condition, and everyone who is born with Down syndrome is unique, just as every person on Earth is unique. However, as people in the disability community like to point out to others, pe people are all more like the different. When I was born and my mom was told that I had Down syndrome, she did not know what that meant. She had never heard of Down syndrome, and to the best of her knowledge, she had never encountered anyone with Down syndrome before. In fact, other than rare glimpses of a group of students with various disabilities being led to a room at the end of a very long hallway in her high school where they were sequestered away from everyone else, she did not have any other experiences with someone with a disability. In the past, people with disabilities were secluded and excluded from society. Today, there is much more inclusion, but still not nearly enough. Many people still have never met or interacted with a person with Down syndrome. Those stereotypes persist. As a, as the education program associate at NDSS, and as a disability advocate, I consider it my mission to dispel those stereotypes and to invite others to include people with Down syndrome and other disabilities in their social lives as well as their workplaces. Within minutes of my birth, doctors told my parents that I would most likely never learn to read or write and that I was older, I would probably end up working in a sheltered workshop where workers with disabilities were are secluded from their typical peers and are often paid sub minimum wage. My mom did not understand how the doctors could make such predictions about my future abilities and the path I would follow in life. Thankfully, she did not take the doctor's words to heart. My mom had been a preschool teacher before I was born and my family has always highly valued education. My mom noticed from the very first moment I was, I opened my eyes, I looked at the world with great curiosity, which led her to believe that I would be capable of great things. She became determined to do her very, very best to help me learn as much as I could, which has resulted in me becoming a lifelong learner. Not only did I learn to read and write at a very young age, I might add, but I went on to earn a standard high school 
degree and to graduate from Northern Virginia Community College, summa cum laude. I then transferred to George Mason University, from which I recently graduated, again, the summa cum laude. This May, I received a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Sociology with a concentration in Inequality and Social Change. My studies and my work perfectly complement each other. As a, as a sociologist, I examine society's stru structural and systemic inequalities and as an advocate. I use this knowledge to try to bring about positive change. I was also born with a, a congenital heart condition, which is fairly common with Down syndrome. I have had four open heart surgeries, three when I was a baby and one when I was 10. As I grew, my heart couldn't keep up with the rest of my body. And I had frequent episodes of laser vagal uh, asyncope or, or collapsing. My cardiologist determined that there's nothing more that could be done surgically to help me and that I was in need of a life-saving heart transplant. I am so very grateful to have celebrated the 10th anniversary of my heart transplant on January 30th of this year. I am also so very honored to have a bill before the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives that is named after me. The Charlotte Woodward Organ Transplant Discrimination Prevention Act. Too often, people with disabilities are denied life saving organ transplants because of institutional bias and prejudice and discrimination in the medical field against people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and other disability conditions. And my bill aims to prevent this. I was born the year before the Americans with Disabilities Act became law. According to the ADA National Network, the ADA is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life, including jobs, schools, transportation, and all public and private places that are open to the general public. The purpose of the law is to make sure that people with disabilities have the same rights and opportunities as everyone else. This is something that I work to ensure for people with Down syndrome as the education program associate at the National Down Syndrome Society. And it is something that I encourage all of you to do as well. Having a disability is a natural part of life. People with disabilities are more like the difference. People with disabilities, including those with Down syndrome, have the right to be proud of who they are, to be treated with dignity and respect, and to be included. You, you can check out NDSS Employment Program section on the National Down Syndrome Society's website at ndss.org. And you can find resources uh, which include information on ABLE accounts, employment and volunteer work, em employment webinars, such as this one, uh, and a financial wellness guide. And other topics that you can read about are partnering for career success, resume information, a guide me and watch me succeed, guidebook, employing individuals with Down syndrome, a sub minimum wage guide. COVID-19 employment tips, et cetera. Inclusion in all aspects of society is so very important. When my mom was younger, people with disabilities were secluded rather than included, which is why she had never known anyone with Down syndrome until she had me. And it is why she had never met any students with disabilities at her high school because they were sitting away from their non-disabled peers. I would like to emphasize that Segregation and isolation does not equal inclusion. The world is a better place for where everyone is able to participate and contribute to the best of their abilities. We can all learn from each other. I can learn from you and you can learn from me. We all have inherent value and worth. We all have unique gifts. 
we all also have our own strengths and challenges, as well as unique learning and working styles that should be celebrated and explored. This is why people with Down syndrome deserve to be paid a living wage. According to the NDSS resource called Valued, Able, and Ready to Work, employing individuals with Down syndrome, having people with Down syndrome as employees benefit their colleagues in terms of boosting workplace morale and fostering friendships. People with Down syndrome are loyal, hardworking, determined to succeed, et cetera, where they are in included in, in their workplace. As a result, this creates a workplace environment where people with Down syndrome love to come to work as it fulfills and stimulates them and gives them the opportunity to do things that they care about. My very first paid job was as a bagger at a local grocery store one summer during high school years. While the job gave me the opportunity to gain experience, to demonstrate that I was responsible, to learn how to work hard and interact with others, it was not especially stimulating or fulfilling. I was paid minimum wage, but I knew my worth and value was far greater than that. It wasn't something I saw myself doing long term. I also got experience through volunteer work. I enjoyed volunteering at a local hospital and at a local library. By volunteering, I gained important skills which prepared me to go on to paid employment. In 2017, I was introduced to the National Down Syndrome Society where I was asked to be the Grand Marshal at my local Down Syndrome Association of Northern Virginia Buddy Walk, which is a Down Syndrome Awareness Walk. I remember an NDSS campaign and pop-up restaurant called C21. It was designed to show that people with Down Syndrome have unique barriers to employment, that no one should be defined by their disability, and that employees with disabilities deserve to earn at least the federal minimum wage. Unfortunately, some companies still pay people with disabilities less than the minimum wage. I attended the DC golf event hosted by NDSS, where I submitted my resume to Colleen Hatcher and our current president and CEO, Candy Pickard. I'll never forget that my now chief of staff and I sang the Lizzie McGuire song, this is what dreams are made of. Uh, in December of that year, I signed my official employment contract with NDSS. I met so many great people in the organization when I was invited to attend the holiday party. I am so proud to say that next month, this December, I will be celebrating five years with this incredible organization that supports and demonstrates inclusion and belonging. I love my career at the National Down Syndrome Society. It is very stimulating and fulfilling experience. I am given the opportunity to show responsibility and to take initiative. My input and ideas are highly valued and my contributions the NDSS team are appreciated. In other words, my colleagues include me and respect me and have professional high expectations for me. Having high expectations is very important. People with Down syndrome rise to high expectations, not low expectations. The point is that hiring people with disabilities is beneficial, not just for the employees with disabilities, but also for companies as well. Diversity enriches and strengthens society. And I encourage you to learn more about Down syndrome and to welcome those with Down syndrome and other intellectual and developmental disabilities into your lives and your workplaces. Thank you so much for letting me speak to you today. I'll now pass it over to Ryan. Kayla and Charlotte, thank you so much. Um, I, I catch myself sometimes when we do these presentations, um, 
I, I always want to be mindful of and grateful for the opportunity to call you my colleagues. So thank you so much for sharing your stories and for sharing that insight um, with this audience, but also with me. I feel like it never gets old hearing it. So thank you. Um, if, if we're going to move on. You, <laughs> Likewise. So we want to talk about some some tips for the workplace, right? You've heard these stories and and the journey of two individuals with Down syndrome who have participated in employment. Um, but then I guess part of this question and conversation we're trying to have today is around how does this work uh, in the workplace day to day? What are some steps that you all could take, some practical next steps that you could take? Um, I've had several conversations, uh, many conversations now at this point with companies, um, HR leaders, business leaders, thought leaders within companies and organizations. And one of the greatest comments I've ever received around uh, wanting to be more inclusive in their hiring practices and including individuals with disabilities in the workplace was a gentleman who reached out to me as a, a director within a um, convenience store chain out West. And he said, I want to do this. I want to be an instigator. Uh, so he wanted to be an instigator for inclusive hiring within his organization. I would encourage each of you to think about how can you be a, an instigator, a positive one at that but an instigator um, to really create more inclusive employment opportunities and to create more awareness within your organizations currently um, to hiring people with disabilities. So one of the sort of easiest uh, inroads that I like to share with folks is, is around language. Language is so important. Um, I once heard a man tell a story of, of how um, it, it impacted him to realize that um, when you introduce yourself to someone, you really share two, two things, right? You share your name and you, you share what you do. Or most oftentimes when you meet someone, that's the question you ask is, what's your name and what do you do? Um, and we find that language is so important, right? How we articulate our sense of belonging and, and how we are a part of an organization or how we get to carry out the work that we do day to day is very, very important. And language specifically having to do with how we refer to individuals with Down syndrome and other disabilities, but we'll focus on Down syndrome for this slide, is also very important. So traditionally within the Down syndrome community, we use um, something that's referred to as people or person first language. That is to say that we refer to an individual with Down syndrome first as a person and then as uh, a person with Down syndrome, right? So some examples you'll see on screen here. Um, we might say instead of a Down syndrome child or a Downs child, it should be a child with Down syndrome. Uh, also making sure that we're not describing this as uh, Downs with an apostrophe S. You can see down at the bottom here that that spelling has sort of evolved over the years, but really not giving that, um, that possessive uh, uh, description of Downs to uh, Dr. Langdon Downs, who, who again, first categorized or discovered um, this characteristic, but but really referring to this as Down syndrome, um, just for his namesake. The S in syndrome is lowercase. Again, de-emphasizing that this is some sort of an ailment um, for people who live with Down syndrome. And obviously, or maybe not so obviously, but uh, a term that many of you may be familiar with uh, in various iterations, retard, retarded, um, those terms are no longer considered socially acceptable. In fact, in many uh, circles, they would be completely um, considered derogatory language. So those are just some examples of how language is important within the Down syndrome community. And we'll segue into a conversation around language in other parts of the disability community. So it is important to note that uh, currently language is, um, is, is sort of different based on the disability that you're referring to, but also the preference of the individual. So within, again, the Down syndrome community, People first language or person first language is considered most appropriate and acceptable. Uh, in other cases, identity first language might be considered more appropriate or acceptable. And uh, I'll give you an example within the autism community. People most likely would like to be referred to as autistic, or you may hear uh, a loved one, a parent, maybe a sibling say, My autistic brother. Again, that's not people first language, but that is the preferred language of that community. And if this sounds like a, a foreign language or a lot of information to process, I would say you're in a good spot and that's okay, right? I think that the biggest piece to this is that um, we make an effort as organizations, as individuals, as groups, uh, that we make an effort to address individuals in the way that they may feel most comfortable and also 
the way that they feel uh, that sense of belonging within the organizations that they're a part of. So that's an easy sort of starting place for having this conversation around including people with disabilities in the workplace. I will add that another uh, key for uh, workplace success for individuals with Down syndrome and other disabilities is to have a, a, a workforce a culture of modeling positivity and authenticity and respect. Um, again, you've heard from some ladies that I get a chance to work with. Charlotte mentioned this, Kayla mentioned this, that they both feel respected at the National Down Syndrome Society. I will say that our staff is comprised of about 25% people who identify as having a disability. Um, that is intentional. We wanna make sure that we are modeling this positive example that we want other organizations to, to uh, embrace in their culture and in the community. Also connecting with individuals on an individual level making sure that you're taking time as a as an HR staff or as a um, CEO or um, CFO that you're taking time to get to know the individuals that you work with, regardless of what disability or um, ability level they they have um, that we're continuing to engage with individuals about hobbies about um, things that they enjoy doing outside of um, again just that disability. Also establishing clear expectations and priorities, and sometimes it's required or, or necessary to reestablish those expectations and priorities to make sure that everyone's clear and on the same page about what's expected of each person in their role within the organization. Accessibility is also a key. Um, equity of access, building the right supports and strategies, tools and systems, and then effective communication, verbal, not nonverbal communication, or even in some cases, individuals may use assistive technology to be able to communicate their thoughts, needs, and, um, and what they're trying to say. So I do wanna make sure that I uh, clarify some of this around accessibility. I know at least within the human resources field, a lot of times people think of accessibility, we think of the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA, and we start seeing maybe dollar signs and infrastructure and things that must be built in order to accommodate um, for or create reasonable accommodations for individuals with disabilities in the workplace. I will say that uh, around 56% of accommodations, workplace accommodations, this is according to the Job Accommodations Network or JAN, a division of the Office of Disability Employment Policy, 56% cost absolutely nothing. A good portion of the remaining 44% cost around $500 or less. And um, you can kind of do the math there to figure out that there's really uh, very few accommodations out there that are considered reasonable accommodations that are gonna be a huge um, financial burden to the, to the employer. So definitely something to consider there. Strategies as well as um, you know, other, other tools that can be used. We highly encourage individuals and, and businesses to take a look at our uh, employment program page. Again, I believe Kayla mentioned this, Charlotte probably mentioned this as well. The Show Me, Guide Me, Watch Me uh, workbook or the, the guide that we have on our website that really is built for employers to kind of take a look at how can we be more inclusive? What are some of the steps that we can take when onboarding individuals with Down syndrome into our workplaces? Also thinking of other strategies that could be really based on universal design. That is to say that they are could be beneficial for everyone in the organization. Think about visual guides, ways of representing information and tasks uh, or directives that can be done in a, in a very uh, visible, visible or visual way. Um, when we talk about universal design, think of something like a curb cut, right? Those are ADA uh, required. And that curb cut serves certainly individuals who um, use wheelchairs. That curb cut is also something that I like to see when I'm riding my bicycle through town, um, because I know that that's a pretty steep drop off the curb. So that that curb cut can be, um, again, universally designed and beneficial for all, just as some of these other strategies can be um, designed and benefit all within the workplace. So think about this for just a second. It's kind of an exercise. Again, I'm, I'm not going to do a call and response here, but as you're listening to this, think about what is uh, what are some of the characteristics of exceptional employees? Being on time, right? Bringing your best effort to work, being coachable, being being able to take constructive criticism and feedback use that to better your craft or your skills or your approach to the work that you do, having a positive attitude, being prepared for work, treating others with respect. And we could continue with this list, kind of creating your own in your mind, maybe as you're listening to this. I want you to think about that uh, list of characteristics of exceptional employees. I want you to think about some of the testimony, the stories that you've heard today already. And think about, is this something that's defined by a disability? I hope we can all agree that it's not. 
exceptional employees are not defined by a disability. They're defined by how they show up, how they treat other people, how they're willing to take that constructive criticism or take those directives and be able to apply it to the work that they do in the best way possible to really generate uh, not only a, a tremendous product or outcome within the technical work that they do, but also generate that positive workplace culture that other people want to be a part of. So the disability employment landscape, we are not here to sell you on a sob story, but I do want folks to understand the current landscape and some of the um, barriers to employment that individuals with disabilities face in our country. Currently, the unemployment rate for persons with disabilities is approximately 10%. That's nearly double that of persons who did not identify as having a disability. Employment population ratio for people with disabilities ages 16 through 64, which is that employment uh, employable range, employability range, is 31.4%. People with disabilities earn, on average, 63% of what their non-disabled peers would earn. And less than 20% of working age adults with disabilities were employed. And this is uh, data from 2021. So some industry trends that we think might be a, a good uh, lens to look at when we're speaking to businesses around being more inclusive in hiring practices. Persons with disabilities were more likely to work in service occupations, about 3% more likely. Workers with disabilities were also more likely than uh, those with no disability to work in production or transportation, material moving occupations, right? Almost 2% there. And workers with disabilities were also more likely to work in sales and office occupations, again, close to 2%. So these aren't necessarily trying to, you know, point to or pigeonhole a particular industry, but these are definitely some, some markers, some indicators uh, that might be beneficial when company leaders are thinking about hiring individuals with disabilities. A couple other key pieces, and these were alluded to by my colleagues a little bit earlier, the benefits to companies. This is based on the Accenture study, and I'm happy to share that with uh, Martha and folks at ISSA to be able to uh, disseminate this information to our group today and those that will listen in the future. Organizations that priorita prioritize disability inclusion experience 28% higher revenue, 30% higher profit margins, and in some cases, double net income. 78% of individuals, this came from one of our studies uh, that were surveyed, said that people with Down syndrome have a positive imp impact on their workplaces. Improvements to the organizational health have also been cited. And employers who embrace disability saw 90% increase in employee retention. Think about the cost associated with turnover in a large company. Then think about how a company, simply by building inclusive practices, hiring practices, and having disability be a part of their diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies, uh, can increase that retention rate. Think about the cost reduction in that statistic alone. Another way of looking at this is the marketing standpoint. So the external facing pieces of a business. Just for the information of this group, persons with disabilities are categorized as the largest, excuse me, the third largest market segment in the country behind African-American and Hispanic populations. Also wanna note that disability is not defined by a particular uh, ethnicity or a particular uh, geographic region. It is not more prevalent in one area or another. It affects um, all areas of diversity in uh, the same. People with disabilities in the United States have an annual discretionary spending power of $220 billion, which doesn't include their family, doesn't include friends, the folks that are close to them, right? So you think about the buying power, the consumer uh, power of $22 billion and the impact that has on GDP as well as on individual businesses. And finally, uh, I wanna mention an association. Some of you may have seen this in the chat. Uh, the National Down Syndrome Society uh, is one of three founding members of an organization called the CEO Commission for Disability Employment. So about five years ago, uh, NDSS got together with Voya Financial and the Society for Human Resource Management, understanding that uh, disability inclusive hiring needed to be um, a major part of company culture all across the globe, but starting in the United States. So the CEO Commission for Disability Employment uh, is really leading the way to a more inclusive workforce. We have grown over the past couple of years 
um, from our, our founding members to now 22 members. We are represented uh, by businesses, we like to say from Main Street to Wall Street, companies that are you know traded, uh, publicly traded companies, Fortune 500 companies, and companies that are even owned and operated by individuals with disabilities. And that creates a very unique perspective. We wanna make sure that um, as the, uh, the motto sort of for the disability rights movement goes, nothing about us without us. We wanna make sure that we have individuals with disabilities at the table when we are looking at ways of impacting um, inclusive employment through policy, practice, and, um, and relationship building. We would highly encourage you all to check out our website um, obviously, we've shared a lot with the National Down Syndrome Society, so www.ndss.org, but also you can visit and learn more about the CEO Commission at www.ceocommission.org. So with that, we will open it up for questions. I think we have just a few minutes here and would like to ask that you, if you do have a question, you could put that in the Q&A um, chat. And we'll be monitoring those chats. And while we're waiting for a few questions to come in, I just wanted to kind of go back and look at a few pieces that Kayla and Charlotte both pointed out. Um, they they've they know my questions, so I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna give them that exercise today. But I do want to point out that um, one of the things Charlotte mentioned in in her speech was talking about um, the fact that she. Uh, graduated summa cum laude right from both of her degree programs that's something that i could only aspire to think back to one of those first slides we talked about that uh that shared again that textbook definition around intellectual disability cognitive processing and those things um obviously there are ways and and examples of individuals who have defied those odds i think about kayla's um points about working in a in a um salon for 14 years and having the right supports her colleague Rachel who served as a mentor to her um, having the right supports in place can really make all the difference in the world and and with that uh, the sky's the limit we see a question in the chat will participants to this webinar have the PowerPoint presentation emailed we will definitely be sharing our slide deck as well as links to resources and websites that we have mentioned um, in the presentation thank you for that question There's another question around finance, or excuse me, local resources to employ more individuals with Down syndrome. Is there a database? Great question. Um, so certainly visiting the National Down Syndrome Society's website. Um, you can email me, I will share. We actually have a slide with our contact information. So please um, record this down, send me a message and we will get you in touch with um, the folks that can really help with that. We do have a network of about 300 local Down syndrome affiliates around the country that we leverage in cases where we know employment opportunities um, are available and we want to connect folks directly to employment ready um, and working age individuals with Down syndrome. But there are also um, companies that we partner with that source talent directly from the disability community. Uh, this is an incredible value add for members of the CEO Commission for Disability Employment. We do have database. Um, like this available, and um, it's it's a part of what we offer to our members. Great question. So and with that, I had to step out for a second. Thank you, Kayla. With that, it looks like we're coming up on our time. <laughs> Great question. So, uh, yes, question thank was, you, Jeff. How do the um, ladies, Charlotte and Kayla, stay so enthusiastic? I'll I'll let you all answer that one. Go ahead, Charlotte. I will be with myself. I did let you go first. Okay, thank you. Um, it really comes down to you know having uh, courage and faith and hope and all that. Though there are times when uh, when I uh, don't feel that way uh, and uh, get frustrated um, about the uh, lack of taking action on dis a, 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 a disability rights that that I feel down on myself. I try not to get that way, but um, uh, the majority of my life has been that way. 
When I first started with Special Olympics and I get my full speech, this way I found the confidence to speak and speak on behalf of everybody else. So I want to say my confidence. My mom always said I'm stubborn, which is always true. Um, that always kept my my enthusiasm, and I will continue to have it no matter what the case may be. Thank you, Jeff. We will. I want to just add a quick thought here too. I think a lot of times um, this is a part of a stereotype that I hear a lot, maybe just where I live, my part of the country, that individuals with Down syndrome, um, or maybe even the term Down syndrome comes from a person feeling down. I, I think that we have obviously kind of addressed that, but that, um, and then there's the other stereotype too, that someone with Down syndrome is always the happiest person in the room, or they're always happy, or they're always that wanting to give hugs. I think we can say now um, that individuals with Down syndrome are are people and they experience emotion, highs, lows, everything in between. That individuals with Down syndrome uh, sometimes feel defeated. They sometimes feel like they've conquered the world. Um, again, we have before us two women who testify before Congress and have made a significant impact, not only on the disability community, but on the world and on the country and how disability um, looks in, in this country. And um, I, I always kind of joke that when I first came on board, I was a bit ashamed that I was so in awe of Charlotte and Kayla because I, I myself have an older sister with Down syndrome and have, have grown up under her uh, leadership in many ways. She has inspired me in many ways. And uh, at some level, I was almost just amazed that Charlotte and Kayla have accomplished so much. And again, I, I uh, was a bit ashamed that I even felt that way because um, in my mind, I had some preconceived notions, uh, even with a lifetime of experience. So again, I think we all need to make sure that we give ourselves grace and uh, allow space for understanding and for new information when it comes to including people with Down syndrome and other disabilities uh, in daily life, but in our workplaces as well. All right. Well, it looks like the chat has slowed down. Um, Martha, uh, I know Jeff is kind of behind the scenes uh, to the folks at ISSA. Thank you so much for having us, for hosting this webinar. Um, to my colleagues, Charlotte, Kayla, thank you so much for joining me and really carrying the team here. Uh, and thank you to all of those in attendance for um, being open to this conversation. We hope that you will continue to reach out from your organizations respectively to learn more about ways we can be inclusive in hiring individuals with Down syndrome and uh, in promoting more diverse workplaces. So thank you all so much. Thank you, much appreciated. Thank you.